Welcome to Sunday here at Sweet Home Evangelical Church. I'm Pastor Brian, and uh, we're also, this is kind of special here too, because we're also welcoming uh, the Adna Evangelical Church today. And uh, our friends Jeremy and Shauna Harlan were part of our church for a couple years. And uh, last year, a little over a year ago, we sent them up to Adna Evangelical Church, uh, where they've been ministering. And... Um, I've, I've always been kind of wanting to go up to Adna and, and kind of secretly hoping that I could preach in Jeremy's church. So this is like about as close as I can get right now. Um, we're, we're praying for Jeremy and Shauna. They, uh, they had a, a family emergency. I talked with Jeremy a couple days ago and, and um, uh, they're a bit overwhelmed. Jeremy talked with the superintendent, and the superintendent said, you need to take some time off. And so uh, during this, this video church time, uh, Jeremy's just going to allow me to preach at the Adna Church too. And so we don't need to get into all of what's going on in Jeremy's life, but just know that it's, it's a bit overwhelming, and uh, we're praying for him uh, because, you know, the... Uh, the devil loves to uh, cause problems for pastors uh, because then he can get the church off track. And um, speaking of off track, our, it seems like our world is off track right now the past couple weeks. Uh, we, we've seen all kinds of problems uh, when you watch the news. And, you know, the, our world is just full of, of chaos and, and there is, you know, prejudice and racism and just all kinds of issues going on and and there are laws against all of these things um, and the Bible talks about this too there there's God's law in the Old Testament and then the then in the New Testament we see especially in Romans and, and Galatians how the limits of the law the law is good but there are limits because the law can't change your heart and that's why Jesus came. Only Jesus can change your heart. Jesus is the one who can bring spiritual solutions. Uh, we have, there, there's no political solution that's going to fix all these spiritual problems in our country. Uh, we are uh, getting into uh, phase two uh, here in Lynn County. That means we can have church in the building. Uh, we probably could have met today, uh, but we're going to pause just a little bit longer. We'll meet next Sunday. Uh, they, we, we're not in a race to be the first church back. I've talked with uh, pastors who have already been meeting in their buildings uh, for a few weeks now, and some of them are, are actually even following the rules doing that. But we're going we're gonna to do our best to follow the rules, and, and we'll, we're, we'll meet next Sunday. It'll be great. Uh, you'll get something in the mail this week that will uh, you know, so explain things, and, and please read that. Follow, uh, follow these rules. They're not my rules. They're CDC guidelines. Today we're wrapping up uh, in Ephesians chapter 6. We've been uh, looking at the armor of God. This, this, um, uh, this armor of God that you get when you become a Christian, it is standard equipment that is issued to every believer, but you need to put it on. And uh, so that's, that's what we're looking at today. Uh, we are... Oh, I don't have Donna to do any music with us today. The kid's working. Uh, but uh, let me read from Psalm 93. It says, The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. Indeed, the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken, even though it seems like that. Your throne, O Lord, has stood from time to time immemorial. You yourself are from the everlasting past. The floods have risen up, O Lord. The floods have roared like thunder. The floods have lifted their pounding waves. But mightier than the violent raging of the seas, mightier than the breakers of the shore, the Lord above is mightier than these. Your royal laws cannot be changed. Your reign, O Lord, is holy forever and ever. Dear Lord, we, uh, just at times we've all, you know, we've gone to the coast and we see these mighty waves crashing, and, and they get even more violent during a storm. And we feel like there are storms going on in our world. 
And many of us, many watching and listening today, have storms going on in their lives. But Lord, you are mightier than any of these. And we come to hear from you today. Lord, I pray that you'd be with Jeremy and Shauna, that you would bless them richly. Lord, we thank you for their willingness to serve you and, and just their wonderful spirit. Pray that you'd bless them and their family. Lord, we pray that you would uh, bless each person listening and watching today, wherever they are, uh, whenever they're watching this, uh, that you would be with them. Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, tomorrow is actually the birthday for our church here in Sweet Home. Uh, tomorrow is June 8th, and it was on June 8th, uh, back in 1884. Uh, Josiah Bowersox was just elected conference superintendent for the Pacific Conference, and he thought that was kind of boring because he didn't have enough to do, so he started a church here in Sweet Home. And he came to town on Sunday, June 8th, uh, preached three times, people got saved, and they said, hey, let's, let's start a church. And uh, they started a church, met and rented facilities, and six years later, in 1890, uh, they, they got property, which was clear on the east side of town, but they got this piece of property. And, um, oh, they built a building, and then we built this one uh, later on. But uh, this church has been meeting on this piece of property for 130 years, and we look forward to kind of restarting uh, that ministry here on this, on this property where God has met with us over many years. Uh, and, but during this time, even though we haven't been on this property we've been on for years and years and years, the church never really closed. Uh, because of the coronavirus, we, we, we didn't really close. We just moved the church online. And... Um, just like every church has moved online, Adna Church has moved online. I've been able to watch Jeremy preaching from time to time, too. And, and you know, that, that's been awesome, and, and many churches will, will continue some, some sort of online presence after uh, we're able to really get back to church. But, you know, this isn't the first time this has ever happened. We think all of our problems are so important and unique to us, but... Everything has happened before, and so there's nothing, like Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. And back in 1918, they had the, the what, the Spanish influenza, big pandemic going on then. This coronavirus, it is nothing compared to the Spanish influenza. I, that, I looked it up, 500 million people got the Spanish flu around the world, and 50 million people died because of that. Uh, this coronavirus, it's, it's really n not as scary at all as the Spanish flu. And I found something online from a newspaper in Illinois in 1918. You see, these days we got social media. We got Facebook and YouTube and, and Twitter and Instagram and all that stuff. Back in 1918, their social media was the local newspaper. And so you want to notice to go out for everybody, goes in the paper. And um, I, I found online there's a church notice. In the church notices in this newspaper in Illinois, the pastor, you know, under evangelical church, the pastor writes, on account of the epidemic of influenza, Sunday school and regular Sunday worship will be suspended at the evangelical church until the health conditions of the community will again permit public gatherings. We, however, call upon all evangelical people to spend at least a portion of the day in prayer and in reading of the Word of God. Our churches are closed, but the way to God is always open. That's awesome, isn't it? Our churches are closed, but the way to God is always open. Let us use our Christian privilege and enter into closer fellowship with Him for strength, comfort, and guidance. During the past few months, the churches have been closed, but the way to God has always been open. And uh, that is good news for us. We're in Ephesians 6 today. We're looking at the armor of God. And uh, let me just back up and read the passage for you. Ephesians 6, verse 10, a final word. 
Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor, not just some of it, all of it, so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Paul lets us know there is a spiritual battle taking place. When we look around in our world, all we see is the flesh and blood reality. And, and that's, that's where a lot of these protests and marches are, are going, and, you know, and that's fine. However, spiritual issues, there is spiritual warfare. So what does Paul say? Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness, for shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop all the fiery arrows of the devil, Put on salvation as your helmet and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay, so we've got this armor of God. This, when you become a Christian, God gives this to you, but you need to put it on. And he gives it to you so you can stand firmly against the strategies of the devil. We're going to be patient during frustrations, and we're not giving in to temptations. And how do we do that? We put on the belt of truth, God's truth. Right now, there is just, there's so much out there, not just with the protests, but before that with coronavirus, there's so much information that conflicts with each other, you don't know what to believe. When it comes to spiritual matters, we believe God's truth, that we put on the belt of truth, the breastplate, the body armor of righteousness, the shoes of peace. Shoes of peace are better than anything that Nike makes because you are walking in peace. You hold up the shield of faith. And today, in the helmet of salvation, we talked about that last week, where you invite Jesus into your life. When you experience salvation, when you trust in Jesus as your Savior, and today we're talking about swords. Swords are kind of important, right? I, I love all the sword fight movies. When I was a kid, I loved the sword fight movies. And swords are important. I, you know, you look at the stories. What is King Arthur without his sword Excalibur? Or uh, Braveheart, uh, William Wallace. I mean, he's got that big giant sword. It's called the Scottish Claymore. And without that, who is he? Uh, what, what is Luke Skywalker without his lightsaber, okay? <laughs> the sword's important. And when the Bible's talking about the full armor of God, this is the only weapon. Everything is armor, but this is the only weapon. There are not backup weapons. There's like daggers and knives and arrows or pepper spray. This is the only weapon. It's just the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the only weapon in the armor of God because you only need one weapon. Our little denomination, it comes from a a larger family of denominations uh, that trace their heritage to John Wesley and the Methodist uh, revival. And John Wesley said that he was a man of one book. Now, he didn't mean that literally because he read lots of books. He wrote plenty of books, yet his life was based on this one book, the Bible. Uh, When I I got to go to Israel a few years ago and um, in Bethlehem, uh, there was something that I wanted to see. Uh, you know, there's the Church of the Nativity. They think that that's where Jesus was born, but they don't know. They're just guessing. But what we do know is there's the office for St. Jerome. Uh, the Old Testament was written in Greek. New Testament, or Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. Uh, but it's during the time of the Roman Empire, and you got all these people who speak Latin. And so St. Jerome was commissioned to translate the Bible into Latin, which the Catholic Church used for years and years and years. And and Jerome spent quite a while translating 
the scripture, and he did that right in Bethlehem, which is awesome. And so he spent a lot of time in God's word, and, and, and my favorite quote from St. Jerome is, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. That's true, isn't it? You don't really know Jesus unless you spend time in his word. That's where we find out about Jesus. Jesus uh, talks about himself, and he said quite plainly, he says in John 5, 39, the scriptures point to me. Uh, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, the scholars say, oh, it probably wasn't Paul, uh, but they don't know. I'm, I'm really hoping it was Paul for some reason, but who knows who wrote it. But in Hebrews chapter 4 is the other place where it talks about the word of God and swords. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active. It is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit. The Bible's compared to a sword. It is part of the armor of God and a very important part of this whole package here. If we have every other piece of the armor of God, if we've put on everything else, but we don't have the Bible with us, we are little more than just armored moving targets. Uh, we, we have, you know, we have, but we have the word of God. We have the Bible. We're not relegated to just taking spiritual hits from time to time and trying to get through life. We have the Word of God to help us live a successful spiritual life. But how do we do that? Just like a sword, uh, you can't just pick up the Bible and use it to its fullest potential right away. Uh, there's, a, there's a piano over there. Uh, anybody can go to that piano, press the keys, make some noise but you're not really playing a song yet, right? Anybody can pick up a sword and cut something, usually your finger, uh, but you, you're not really using it to its fullest potential. Uh, you need practice, right? Uh, our, our girls, Kayla and Maria, both years and years of practice so that they could play the piano and, and they're amazing. And just like with the Bible, you need practice. And the more time you spend practicing with the Bible, the more time you're reading it and, and spending time with it, the better you're going to understand. And the more you'll understand who Jesus is and what he came to do and what this means in your life, uh, you know, you will get to know all of this. But you need to do the, spend time. As I get older, I, I'm seeing... Uh, younger pastors or newer pastors with, with different eyes. Um, during this coronavirus time, uh, every pastor is a televangelist now. So I, I've watched a lot of uh, a lot of preachers. Uh, I've, I've tried to watch uh, pastors here in town and uh, uh, pastors in the conference, pastors in the denomination, and and just you know as many uh, people as I know. And, and it's, been, it's been interesting. Some have been great. Uh, some have been okay. Uh, but, you know, it, it's interesting how I can, I can always tell a new, a new pastor or someone, you know, new to being a pastor because the, the new guys, they rely a lot more heavily on personal testimony. That's totally fine. It's totally fine. Perfectly valid thing to do. But... There comes a point when you run out of life-changing stories and you need to dig into God's word. You need to see what is God saying to us. And, and that's what it is to have this word of God. You need to dig into it. You don't just kind of look at it from time to time, but dig into it. What is God saying to us? Okay, so how do we do that? I got four things for you that we'll go through quickly here. Number one, you need to pray. You start with prayer. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 18, open my eyes to see the wonderful truths of your instructions. Uh, Psalm 119, it is the longest of the Psalms. Uh, Psalms is the biggest book in the Bible, and this is the biggest of the Psalms, and it is all about God's Word, reading God's Word, spending time in God's Word. I think that should tell us something <laughs> if the longest of the Psalms is about spending time in God's Word. And it says in several places, but quite clearly in verse 18, to ask God to open your eyes so that you can see clearly God's word written for us. 
If you have a passage with your, that you're struggling with and struggling to figure out or struggling to find out how does this apply to you, maybe talk to the author. Ask God to show you the wonderful things in his word. In the New Testament, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. In the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, it says, ask and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know. It's an amazing passage there. Back when I was a young pastor, I, uh, I made an appointment uh, to talk with Randy Butler at Salem Evangelical Church. I, it was in my first year of pastoring. Um, Randy Butler's about 10 years older than I am, and uh, he had been a youth pastor at Salem Evangelical with John Sills for four or five years, and, and now he had been the senior pastor at Salem for six or seven years at that point. The church had doubled in size, all kinds of good things going on, and, and as a young new pastor, I wanted to see, is there something I could learn from Randy? Now, I, so I made an appointment, I, I went to see Randy, and Randy Butler, he's, he's pretty intense, uh, he kind of scares me a little bit, uh, don't tell him that, uh, but uh, when I sat in his office and I mentioned something that, about how he didn't really have that many books in his office, and I, then I was afraid I offended him because he, he said that he doesn't have a lot of commentaries. Uh, he said, people give me commentaries and I just give them away to somebody else. Uh, and he said to me, quote, I don't care what a bunch of dead Englishmen have to say about the Bible. I pray a lot and see what God has to say about the Bible. <laughs> that's, that's a bit brash. Uh, I haven't thrown away all my books, but it, it made a lot of sense to me and has helped me over the years. When I'm preparing a sermon or something, I, I pray a lot. And I ask that same question each time. Lord, what do you have to say to us today? What do you have to say to us from this passage? And we go to the author to find out what God is saying to us. You spend time in prayer. And then number two, we need to spend time in God's Word. In, in, in smaller passages, we, we focus on that, spend time on that. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the message uh, about Christ uh, in all its richness fill your lives. Uh, there's another translation that says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. God's Word is to dwell in you. It is to be a part of you. That famous Psalm 119, uh, the writer talks about how, um, oh, I, I just remember it in King James, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, right? Talks about hiding God's word in their heart. And, and, it, and it doesn't necessarily mean uh, memorizing God's word, which is a good thing, okay? I'm not saying don't memorize God's word. You need to do that, but it goes beyond simple memorization. It is spending time in God's Word, letting it dwell in you. There's a word for that. It's called meditation. Now, I, just stick with me here, okay? Meditation seems kind of New Age, Eastern religion, Buddhist weird stuff, which is kind of true, okay? You know, there is that. But the Bible calls us to meditate. And so how do we do that? Okay, how many of you know how to worry? Anybody, just raise your hand wherever you're at. Do you know how to worry? I think I'm pretty good at it. I think I'm a little better than average at, at, at knowing how to worry. And, and what happens when we worry? Worry is when we dwell on our problems and we think about it over and over again. And, 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 and meditation's a little bit like that. Instead of thinking about our problems over and over again, we focus on God and God's Word over and over again. And what does this mean to us? And we, and we ruminate on that. We put it in the slow cooker and just let it, you know, let it put it there and let it simmer. In Psalm 145 verse 5, it says, I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Eastern religions, they push meditation to empty your mind 
but God calls us to fill our mind with him and his word. Uh, it, the book of Joshua, right at the beginning of the book of Joshua, Joshua is this new leader. He's got this task of leading the people into the promised land. And in Joshua chapter 1, it says, God tells Joshua, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in, in it. Only then. Will you prosper and succeed in all you do? Success and prosperity comes when you're meditating and spending time in God's Word. Uh, to be able to use this sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, you, you pray, you ask God, the author, to open your eyes so that you can see this. You spend time uh, on, on, on you know, smaller chunks of God's Word, meditating on it. And what does this mean? And then number three is context. This is where you look at the bigger chunks of Scripture. Uh, these days, the press is amazing at taking things out of context and then making politicians look bad, okay? They, this, there's a new example every day of how this works. You know how this works. And it's constantly happening. It's wrong. We all know it's wrong, but that's what they do. The same thing happens with the Bible. Uh, people take a verse or half a verse out of context, and then they're saying, hey, the Bible says it's okay for me to do this thing that I wanted to do. Uh, there's a word for this. It's called proof texting. It's when you have in your mind what you want to do, and then you go to the text of the Bible looking for proof to confirm what you already wanted to do. And that's, that's got things backwards there. You see, context is important. The whole Bible fits together as one big story. Uh, there's people that say the Old Testament isn't important anymore. Uh, the new, but I, I'm telling you, the New Testament, completely based on the message of the Old Testament, the coming of Jesus was foretold in the prophets. The writings of Paul in the New Testament epistles were deeply rooted in the Old Testament. Paul talks about looking at all of God's word. He says in Romans 15, 4, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us, and the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. There are way too many people that that you know they ignore the old testament or they just ignore portions of the new testament they they ignore good chunks of the bible because well it makes them uncomfortable or it's currently politically incorrect uh, the bible gets misused over and over again because people treat the bible like you're going through the buffet at Izzy's where you take what you want and you leave what you don't want. I want the pizza and I want the ribs. I'm going to leave the liver and the broccoli. And that's how they treat the Bible. But to use this sword called the Bible, you need to pray. You ask God to teach you from his word. Spend time uh, meditating on, on a verse or two or a chapter, um, but also read it in context. Read it as, as a whole there where you don't just pick and choose. And then number four, just do it. Just do it. James 1.22, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. James points out the futility of just reading the Bible and then not doing what it says. And there comes a point in life when, when you read the Bible and you're going to have to put that into action in your life. It's, it's kind of like reading books about swimming. Uh, you, you know, you can read books on swimming, you can own books on swimming, you can have autographed copies of books on swimming, you can have every book ever written on swimming on your bookshelf, but that doesn't mean you know how to swim. There comes a point where you have to get in the pool, and there comes a point where you have to put this into action in your life. During this series, I've talked about this, this armor of God, and, and it, is in the, it is in the context of spiritual warfare. 
he says, so that you can withstand the strategies of the devil. In, and I've talked about this a couple times. In the, uh, there's two big stories of temptation in the Bible. The, the big uh, one at the beginning is the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan comes and tempts them and sin enters the world. The second big story is when Satan comes and tempts Jesus in the wilderness. And each time, and he has similar temptations, yet each time Jesus says no to temptation. And what does he do? He uses the Bible. He says, no, I'm not going to do that because the Bible says. If Jesus needed to use Scripture to overcome temptation, how much more do we need to use Scripture so that we can continue following God and not fall for the lies from the enemy? Uh, because the devil is going to come to you and he's going to try to try to get you to worry about something that is out of your control. Uh, this is why uh, sometimes you just got to turn off the news, right? Uh, and, and, and the devil's going to try to get you to worry about something that's out of your control. And, and yet you can say, you know, I don't need to do that because the Bible says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. When you get frustrated, the devil's going to try to move you from frustration to anger and you can say, I'm not going to do that because the Bible tells me uh, God says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, all types of evil behavior. For anger gives a foothold to the devil, and that's why you're trying to get me angry. The devil will try to tell you, you know, people don't really care about you. Your pastor doesn't really care about you. Those people in church, they don't really care about you. You're not welcome there. God doesn't care about you. You're not good enough. That's not true. And you can say, nope, it's not true because the Bible tells me, God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The next couple of weeks, uh, I'm going to be in my office, but I'll be doing school online. And uh, so that'll be an experience. Uh, I, it's, it's been good for me uh, doing school the past oh, two and a half years. Uh, I have made mistakes along the way. I just caught another one a few days ago where, oh my goodness, I found out Thursday night I have a bunch more work that I needed to do before Monday morning that I hadn't done yet because I wasn't paying attention. And every time I have uh, been late on work or haven't gotten the grade I wanted, it's because I didn't read the directions. <laughs> I didn't read the syllabus close enough, and I didn't read the directions, and I got into problems. And you know what? That's how it works in life. Every single time where I have had problems in life, it's because I didn't read the directions in God's Word. I'm going to pray for you. And um, today, can we commit again to say, I'm going to put on this full armor of God. The helmet of salvation is important. You can't get anywhere until you've asked Jesus into your life. You also need the shield of faith. You need peace, righteousness. You, you, need, um, you need all of this armor of God. But you also need to spend time in God's Word and use that. And let me pray for you. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray for each person watching, listening, Right now, whoever they are, wherever they are, if they're in Sweet Home, Adna, or anywhere else in the world, Lord, I pray that you would be there with them right now. That they would um, hear from you. Lord, open our eyes that we can see what you have for us in your word. We live in this day and age where we have such easy access to the Bible. But Lord, let that Bible access us in our hearts. Help us to, to come to you and ask you to open your word to us. Help us to focus and spend time uh, meditating on your word rather than meditating on our problems. That we could take it in context and, and just look at the big picture and understand what you have for us. And Lord, help us to, to not just know your word, but to put it in action in our lives. 
that, that we could be your people in a world that desperately needs people who have read your word and are living it out in their lives. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm looking forward to having church here next Sunday, but we'll still be doing video things for a while too because some people will probably be uh, stay home for a few more weeks and isolate. Uh, but anyway, thank you for joining us today. Lord bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.